Well, hello again, all my friends out in internet land. It's Embrace the Question. Welcome to the channel. I hope that maybe there are a few of you that is, this is your first time, so glad to have you. We're doing a Bible Study with Me series where we're tackling right now Exodus. We've finished Genesis, if you want to check those videos out. But Exodus is an amazing book because it's it's the physical representation of being released from bondage by God. And we see it, this reenacted in the spiritual realm later on. So this is a very vital book when it comes to understanding what happens in the New Testament. So I, I'm glad you're with us. We're in Exodus chapter 8. Hopefully, you've caught a few of these, but if you haven't, like I said, you can just back up, start at the beginning of Exodus, and you'll be right back up with us in no time at all. Exodus chapter 8 is interesting because now we are in the middle of the plagues, right? The, the, the infamous 10 plagues where God is judging the gods of Egypt. These are three of the really nasties, really. So let's get into this and talk about these. In Exodus chapter 7, we had the water turned to blood. And I say these are the nasties. That one was pretty nasty, right? The river stank. People had to dig to get water. There wasn't even water in the cisterns that they had in their, in their homes. It all had turned to blood. So they're past this. And you would think maybe they've learned a lesson, but no. That's not how this works. It's not how strongholds really behave. So here we go. Let's see what goes on. Verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. The frogs shall come up on you and on your people and on all your servants. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals and over the pools and make frogs come up out of the land or on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Now for, you know, maybe an eight, nine year old boy, this doesn't sound so bad, right? We like playing with frogs, but imagine, if you will, frogs in your kneading trough, right? You're trying to bake, you're trying to cook, there's frogs everywhere. And we're not talking about the kind that make good frog legs. This is not a good thing. Frogs are slimy little creatures. And if you catch them, they make messes, right? We all remember that maybe from our childhood. So this is a bad one. And you're thinking, why frogs? Well, there was a frog god. There was a frog god. There was a frog-headed god in Egypt. So this one is going to, and at the end, we'll actually do a match. I'll throw a chart up there and we'll do a match from the plagues to the charts. Although I'm not sure that all of these plagues today has an associated Egyptian god. And we'll talk about that too. That's on down the chapter. But Aaron again, Aaron's the one stretching out his staff to do this work. He did the miracle in chapter seven as well. So we really haven't seen Moses heavily involved yet other than speaking to Pharaoh. Why is that important? I just think it's interesting because again, we have a setup where we have Moses as the big guy and then he has a prophet. So we've got someone who hears from God or supposedly hears from God in other situations. And then they have a prophet, a mouth piece. That's what's going on here, but we may see a shift in this chapter. So let's continue on and see what goes on. But the magicians 
did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Note that. Note that right there. He's made a promise. The frogs apparently are pretty miserable even to Pharaoh. He's ready to bargain. He's ready to get rid of the frogs to some point because he's, he's pleading. In the past, Pharaoh was going to harden his heart immediately after his own magicians could duplicate the work. They did it this time. They're creating more frogs. But Pharaoh is ready to get rid of these things, or so you would think. Moses responds in verse 9. Moses says to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me. When am I to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile? And Pharaoh responds, verse 10, Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow is his response. So give me one more night with these frogs. I think it was Perry Stone that did a message called One More Night with the Frogs. It's, it's again, very nonsensical from this guy that is leading Egypt, this supposedly God on earth. He makes the most illogical choices. Give me one more night with the frogs. Moses said, be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs shall go away from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. Verse 12. So Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. Oh, get this. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. Remember what we dealt with with the blood. Everything stunk. The river stunk. Can you imagine the smell? This is no different. Every plague seems to create a stinking mass out of everything. So they've got heaps and heaps of dead frogs. Some cultures would attempt to eat them, right? Not the Egyptians. This is just an environmental catastrophe for them. Verse 15, but, the, but when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So he's broken his promise. This is of note because it explains what happens next. Verse 16, then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. Here's the note. This plague was unannounced. Gnats is one of the nastiest plagues. Uh, pastor joke. It is a really bad one. If, if you've ever been in a place where the gnats were everywhere, it's, it's unpleasant enough when gnats aren't biting. That's unpleasant enough when you're just, they're just in your eyes, they're flying up your nose, they get in your mouth, all of this, lots of gnats. But imagine, if you will, this generalized term for gnats is what we have here in scripture, which includes all small biting flies, including mosquitoes and uh, probably varieties of gnats. Can you imagine what would come off of the Nile River? But these are stinging insects and they're swarming insects. But this one's unannounced because Pharaoh breaks his promise. Aaron does his thing, stretches out his staff, and he strikes the dust of the earth. And the dust becomes gnats. Now, lest we think that this is just metaphorically speaking, Moses wrote this book as he did Genesis, and he uses the same 
terminology in Genesis, only he uses it metaphorically there. He speaks to Abraham and says, Abraham, your children will be as of the dust on the ground, the sands of the sea, the stars in the sky. They will be as of, meaning he is making a point to let us know he's using a metaphor here, but he's not saying it that way here. Here he's saying, strike the dust. The dust will become gnats. Crazy, isn't it? But I think we're going to get it confirmed. Verse 17, and they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth. And there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. That, that phrase continually reappears. There are gnats on man and beast, meaning all living creatures that aren't in the water or below it. I find that fascinating. Particularly fascinating is the magicians can't replicate this one. Why? Why can't the magicians replicate this one? This is the third plague. Does that have anything to do with it? And this plague particularly doesn't seem to be associated with a specific god of Egypt. This seems to be more of a pouring out of judgment upon perhaps the religious systems of Egypt because the Egyptian religious system was, was very much focused on purity and ritual cleansing. And guess what? You can't really be focused on any of that if there are that many flies, that many gnats in your face all the time. You can't. In fact, one of the prescribed methods for, for warding these things off is to rub yourself with fish eggs. I read that. It was in the book of Ain, and that is a horrible thing to be doing, and you wouldn't want to do that if ritual purity was important to you. You can't just rub yourself down with fish eggs and expect to maintain your priestly order. So they're in a spot. Perhaps that has something to do with it. I went down to the beach a few years ago, probably getting close to 10 years ago, in a particular part of, of the southern coast that had, it was next to a swamp. Beautiful beach, incredible beach. Water's incredible. But behind us was a swamp, and that swamp just happened to be hatching black flies. At the time, it, it only happens for a few weeks a year. We were the lucky ones to pick those few weeks. And we didn't know about it until we stepped out of the car to get into our home. We step out of the car and we are just attacked by these flies. And they, they would bite they hurt. And you, you couldn't get away from them. All you could do is get in the water. So we spent a good number of days just sitting inside to try to get away from the flies. And my friend that was with me to this day has scars on his legs from these bites. So biting insects like this are no laughing matter. Huge plague. All right, let's continue. The magicians have admitted to Pharaoh, look, we can't, we can't do anything to emulate this. This is the finger of God, verse 19. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. It's the same message every time. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled 
with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. I want to stop and just remind you that we saw him say, I will take away the frogs, but we have not seen him say, I will take away the gnats. So they're still, de they're still dealing with gnats and the flies are coming. Okay, that's interesting. That, that's really going to compound things, don't you think? Okay, so verse 22, but on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. This is a direct correlation to what we find in Malachi 3.16 when he says, I will make up a book of remembrance and I will set apart those that belong to me from everything else so that everyone will know that I am God and that I take care of mine. That's what he's doing here. This is, this is just another facet. All right, verse 23, thus, I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen. Verse 24, and the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by swarms of flies. Okay, this one, I, I don't know if there's a significance to this, but this one wasn't done by Moses or Aaron. It was announced, tomorrow there will be flies, but it wasn't done. There was no, hold your staff out, smite something with it. There will be flies come out of it. No, the Lord is sending flies. It's just another parallel, something to go, hmm, wonder why the difference here. Verse 25, then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, go, sacrifice to your God within the land, within the land, which is not the deal. But Moses said, it would not be right to do so, for the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are, in, are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. Three days is important. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go. Sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you must not go very far away from me. Plead for me. Okay, now he's, he's bargaining again. He's not saying he will. He's just not saying he won't. He's not being specific. He's just saying, don't go very far away. Meaning, I'll let you go, but I don't want you to go three days away. Then Moses said, behold, I'm going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh and from his servants and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So the cheating was noted. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh. From the servants, from his servants and from his people, not one remained. That's an interesting statement. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Well, that doesn't seem too smart, does it? So really, this is the basis for a lot of talks on judgment and the judgment of God particularly. I think we should ask, what is God judging here? What is God judging? Is he judging Pharaoh? Okay, I would buy that. Is he judging Egypt for Egypt's sake? I'm going to say, no, I think he's judging a system that is keeping people enslaved. That's what God always goes to war against. Any system that keeps people enslaved. And we will find this more than once in scripture. We will find this particularly in the time of Jesus when he is warring with the religious authorities because their law has been twisted to the point where now it's only keeping people enslaved. And we're going to find out what he does about that. That's, 
the Gospels. So what do you think? What do you think? How would you like, can you imagine enduring any one of these so far? This is the fourth plague. Any one of these. Has, have any of you really dealt with anything similar to that? Other than, I mean, I can't think of anything that would compare really to frogs in every nook and cranny of your home, in your oven, your pots, your pans, and you got flies. I, I know that there are seasons here, especially in Arkansas, where flies just come out of the woodwork. All of a sudden, there's 50 flies in the house and the cats are doing somersaults in the living room trying to, you know, attack flies. But nothing like what this is talking about. I, I have no grid for it. I've seen some very plague-like things on Earth where things are migrating from one point to another. Spiders sometimes. Um, bats, which aren't, they, they don't really get in your stuff. Flies are bad. Locusts are bad, especially parts of Africa. Have any of you experienced these things? Let me know. Let me know. I'd be really interested in hearing your story. That's it for Exodus chapter 8. Not a really long chapter. The, um, the plagues are interesting, and they're going to get more interesting as we go. Before you go, get some Solway coffee. Do yourself a favor, but do a ministry a favor. Just invest, and you'll get coffee out of it. How cool is that? I'm continually just using these bags up, and I'm keeping them all because I want my office to smell like coffee. That's it for this time. I'll check you guys next week. Peace.